Christians are people who believe that Jesus rose from the dead. As we confessed in the Apostles' Creed earlier in the service, the third day he rose again from the dead. But did it really happen? Did Jesus actually rise from the dead? Maybe you didn't know that it was okay to ask that question on Easter Sunday. You know, I taught you at the beginning of the service, we say he is risen, he is risen indeed. We don't say he is risen, maybe. We don't ask that question on Easter Sunday. But if we're honest, many if not all of us, have asked ourselves, how can I really believe that Jesus rose from the dead if I haven't seen him and touched him for myself? Just this morning, I was preparing to come to church, and I, of course, knew what I was going to preach about, and I'm sitting next to my toddler daughter eating breakfast And I'm eating one of those sugary cereals that really should probably be dessert, and she's eating something healthier. (laughs) And she knows that what I'm eating is normally better than what she's eating, and so she asks me, can I have your cereal? And so I told her, I said, well, you can, but you need to finish your breakfast first. So she looks at my bowl, she looks at her food, she looks at my bowl again, she looks at her food, she thinks, and then she says, I want to see it. I want to see the cereal. So I took my bowl, I showed it to her, she looked at it for a second, and then she grabbed the rest of her breakfast and stuffed it in her mouth. (laughs) It's human nature, even for toddlers, We don't want to make a commitment, even as small as eating the rest of our healthy breakfast, if we haven't seen it for ourselves. So it's human nature to ask that question about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, something a little bit more important than whether or not we finish our breakfast. How can we believe if we haven't seen it for ourselves Now, maybe just like you thought that it wasn't okay to ask that question on Easter Sunday, maybe you would think that the Bible wouldn't want to take that question head on. Maybe you would think that the Bible would be embarrassed to engage with that question. Maybe you think that the Bible is only a book for people who have never doubted, only a book for true believers If you think that, you would be wrong. And one of the reasons that you would be wrong is because the story of Thomas is in the Bible. Yes, doubting Thomas. So I want to invite you to turn with me in your copy of the Bible to John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. If you don't have a Bible with you, There is a black-covered Bible in the back of the pew in front of you, and you're welcome to use it during the service. If you would like to use that Bible, then John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31, can be found on page 907 of that Bible. Page 907. Before I read the passage, I want to set the context for you which will be easy because Evan actually read it earlier in the service. As Evan read, Jesus appeared to a series of people on the first Easter Sunday. After Jesus rose from the dead, his empty tomb was discovered by Mary Magdalene, then Peter, and then John. Later that day, Jesus appeared to Mary, then he appeared to the disciples. But Thomas, Thomas was not there. 
when it happened. And that's the context for the story that I'm about to read. So will you stand for the reading of the Word of God? John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24 and reading through verse 31. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You may be seated. This story gives you three reasons. Three reasons. A reason to doubt, a reason to believe, and a reason to read. So first, a reason to doubt. Verse 24, if you look back at the story, says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. You want to talk about fear of missing out. What an event to miss. Could you imagine if, while you were out getting the pizza, Jesus appeared to all of your friends, and you missed it? Verse 25 says what you would expect. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but listen to how Thomas responded again. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas had a reason to doubt. He had not personally seen or touched the resurrected Jesus. Jesus had been crucified. Nails had been driven through his wrists. So Thomas wanted to touch the scars. Jesus had a Roman spear driven into his side on the cross after he was already dead. So Thomas wanted to put his hand into the wound so that he could know for certain that Jesus really was alive. Thomas demanded personal, physical, immediate proof. And then and only then would he believe. What was going through Thomas's head? Maybe Thomas believed that the disciples had been duped by a look-alike. Someone who looked like Jesus and was claiming to be risen from the dead. Or maybe Thomas thought that the other disciples were simply hysterical in their grief and imagined that they saw Jesus. Maybe Thomas just simply refused to believe something that he knew was impossible. Every one of us 
has something in common with Thomas at the beginning of this story. Not one of us has seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. None of us have seen the Lord. So did Thomas have a good reason to doubt? Because if he did, every one of us has good reason to doubt also. So did Thomas have good reason to doubt? After all, seeing is believing, isn't it? In fact, it is not. And Thomas did not have good reason to doubt. I want to explain why. Thomas claimed that he could never believe unless he saw and touched for himself, but every one of us believes in countless things that we have not personally experienced, and we do it every day. At the end of the day, when I'm talking to my wife at dinner and she tells me about her day, I don't say to her, I'm sorry, honey, but I just can't believe that happened to you because I wasn't there to see it for myself. I know that my wife is a trustworthy witness, so I believe what she says even though I haven't experienced it for myself. Wilt Chamberlain will forever be an NBA legend because he did the impossible. He scored 100 points in a single NBA game. Or did he? Did you know that there is no surviving video of the game? What if the people in attendance just decided that they wanted to be a part of history and they mutually agreed to make up the story? I mean, if you think about it, is it even possible to score 100 points in a single NBA game? Did you know that Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, or any other NBA great has never even come within 15 points of matching that record? After all, we weren't there to see it for ourselves. But we do believe it. Of course we believe it. We believe it because of the testimony of the over 4,000 fans who were at the game. We believe it because of the testimony of the statisticians. Maybe most importantly, we believe it because of the testimony of the players on the other team. Because why would they agree to a story that makes them NBA legends for how many points were scored on them? So Thomas didn't have good reason to doubt just because he hadn't personally seen or touched. The question that Thomas really should be asking and the question that each of us should be asking is, who were the witnesses? The question that we should be asking is, who is testifying that Jesus rose from the dead? The answer to that question, of course, I just read the story, is that the other disciples were testifying to Thomas that Jesus was alive. And I'll give you four quick, obvious reasons that they were, in fact, very reliable. One is that at least some of these disciples had seen the empty tomb. And any of the other disciples, including Thomas, could check for themselves to see if it was actually empty. So the disciples were making a claim, but that claim was backed up by evidence, and it was shocking evidence. A tomb that was sealed with a massive stone and guarded by professional Roman soldiers was now empty. A second reason that these disciples were reliable is that they had spent around three years in close proximity to Jesus and when you think about that, the idea that they were duped by a lookalike is laughable. A third reason the disciples were reliable witnesses is because they claimed to have seen Jesus not as individuals, but as a group. While one person might hallucinate in their grief, 
Does that explain a group of 10 or more people claiming to have seen and experienced him at the same time? I'll give you a fourth reason. It's the most compelling to me personally. The fourth reason why the disciples were reliable witnesses is that it was risky for them to say that Jesus was alive. If you still have your Bible open, look at verse 19, because it says that when Jesus initially appeared to his disciples, the doors were locked. Why were they locked? Verse 19 tells you, for fear of the Jews. That is, for fear of the Jewish authorities who had just crucified Jesus. The disciples were afraid that Jesus' enemies were going to try to round them up and finish the job. So what did they decide to do? They decided to start spreading the made-up rumor that Jesus was alive. Obviously not. This was not a low-stakes game for the disciples. Their lives were at risk. And why would anyone make up a story that put their physical safety at risk? Thomas, of course, didn't know this, but we do. Many of the disciples who testified that Jesus was alive to him would go on to be executed for claiming that that was true. And why would anybody make up a story that they knew might just get their head chopped off? But that's exactly what these disciples did. So were they trustworthy? Were they believable? Were they reliable witnesses? I think the obvious answer is yes. They were trustworthy then, and they are trustworthy today. But someone who is really wrestling with this might ask, okay, even if they were reliable witnesses, even if they really believed that Jesus was alive, isn't it just impossible? Isn't it impossible for someone to rise from the dead? I would answer, for whom? For whom is it impossible? For me? Yes. For you? Yes. For God? When Paul was preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he asked this question, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? But, verse 26 says that eight days passed and Jesus still hadn't appeared again to the disciples. Thomas probably started to think to himself, you see, If Jesus was actually alive, he would have appeared again by now. Second reason, a reason to believe. One mark of the authenticity of this story is that Thomas is not portrayed in a positive light. Thomas is stubbornly and obstinately unbelieving. And you have to ask yourself, If someone was making this story up, would they have portrayed one of their leaders, one of the heroes of their religion, in a negative light? If I was starting a religion, I would have wanted to portray all of its founders in the best possible light so that people would want to follow them. So why is Thomas portrayed in a negative light in this story? Because it really happened. That's why. Look at verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. The disciples were behind shut and locked doors, just like they were eight days earlier, but Jesus appeared in the middle of them and stood among them. Jesus had a resurrected and glorified body that was unlimited by physical boundaries like doors. Of course, we don't understand how this works or exactly what this means, but why should we? 
trying to explain to us how the glorified resurrection body of Jesus worked would be like us trying to explain to someone from the 1500s how an iPhone works. We just don't have categories to understand what this means. But Jesus spoke and he greeted his disciples in the same way. Peace be with you. But this time, Thomas was there. And look at verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus gave Thomas the proof he asked for. So look at verse 28. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. His doubt crumbled in the face of the reality of the resurrected Jesus Christ. You know, one way to understand this story would be that Thomas did a good thing by doubting. After all, he demanded personal proof and Jesus showed up and gave him personal proof. Maybe you should demand that Jesus appears to you. And like he did to Thomas, maybe he will. It could seem like Jesus rewarded Thomas's skepticism. But look at verse 29. In verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Thomas is relatable. We can all relate to his doubt, but he's not an example. Jesus wants you and me to believe in his resurrection without having the personal, physical proof that Thomas had. Hebrews 1 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Some people might say that those who believe without seeing or touching for themselves are gullible. But Jesus says that they are blessed. Jesus gave Thomas a reason to believe. But what is our reason to believe? Because it's different. What is our reason to believe? Our reason to believe is the testimony of the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Eyewitnesses including doubting Thomas. Thomas himself now stands as a witness to the truth of the resurrection, and he shows us that the first Christians were not begging for an excuse to believe. Thomas was skeptical. He doubted. He demanded proof. And Jesus overwhelmed his doubt. And today, Thomas stands as more evidence that it actually happened. But Thomas would not be the last. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. Now listen to this list of witnesses. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, I'm preaching about it this morning, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Why does Paul say most of whom are still alive? He says that because he's saying, go ask them. If you don't believe me, go ask them. He goes on. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. 
If you were alive when 1 Corinthians was written, you could have asked an eyewitness of Jesus for yourself. But we can't do that today. But you know, there are also no living eyewitnesses to George Washington crossing the Delaware. There are no living eyewitnesses to the Mayflower voyage. There are no living eyewitnesses to the bubonic plague, the Black Death. There are no living witnesses to the Crusades. There are no living witnesses to the conquests of Alexander the Great. What matters is not whether the witnesses are alive today. What matters is were they reliable when it was written. And they were. They were. So our reason to believe is the eyewitness testimony of Jesus' disciples, testimony that is overwhelming, authentic, and testimony that is sealed with their blood. But how do we access that testimony today? Where do we get it? Through reading the New Testament. Our third reason is a reason to read. A reason to read. In school, we learned about thesis statements. A thesis statement is a summary of the central point or idea of an essay or book or similar thing. John 20, 30-31 is the thesis statement of the Gospel of John. The whole book. So it's pretty important. Look at verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. In the New Testament, there are four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those Gospels are like biographies of the life of Jesus. But they are not comprehensive. They are not exhaustive. Their goal is not to tell you everything that Jesus said or did They are more like highlight reels of his life that were written for a specific purpose. John ends his gospel with one of the great endings to a book ever. He says in John 21, 25, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. In other words... I left a bunch out. That's what John is saying. So if there was so much for the gospel writers like John to choose from, and if they left so much out, that raises the question, how and why did they choose what they included? Well, John tells us in verse 31, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John took specific words and actions of Jesus and organized them into a unified story for a purpose. His purpose was to persuade people like you and me who have not seen or touched Jesus for ourselves to believe. The Gospel of John exists as our reason to believe. So maybe you can relate to Thomas. Whether you're a Christian or not, maybe you're skeptical of the truth of the resurrection. Maybe you think that you could never really believe unless you saw and touched for yourself. But that is why the Gospel of John exists. The Gospel of John exists so that people like you and me who struggle with doubt, real people, can believe that Jesus really rose from the dead. So if you're doubtful about the resurrection of Jesus, if you're wavering in your faith, if you simply want to be strengthened in knowing that it's true, I have a prescription for you. It's a simple one. Read the Gospel of John. The average person can read the Gospel of John in about two hours. That's not very long for something that could change your life. Read the Gospel of John. If you'd like, 
Someone from our church will meet with you to discuss it with you and explain it to you. And if you're interested in that, just speak to me after the service. You know, I want to speak to a different kind of person. I know that there are probably people here this morning who actually don't think that all this stuff I've been talking about is that important in the first place. There are people this morning who are indifferent to the question of whether or not Jesus really rose from the dead. There are people here this morning who don't think it makes that much of a difference to them either way, and if it makes other people feel good, then good for them. But I want to explain to you why this is the most important question. A question that every one of us must answer. Quite simply, verse 31 of our sermon text says that those who believe have life in his name. The reason that your answer to the question of whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead matters is because believers in him experience eternal life. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the resurrection of Jesus proves that every word he speaks is true. The death of Jesus can only save us from our sins if he actually is the Son of God, and his resurrection proves that he is. When Jesus was on the cross, some of the last words he spoke were, it is finished. And his resurrection proves that it is finished. It is done. By his death and resurrection, Jesus destroyed death. We're going to sing in a few minutes, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. If Jesus really is the Son of God, and his resurrection proves that he is, then every one of us must submit our lives to him and follow him. What did Thomas say? What did Thomas say when he knew it was real? What did Thomas say when he was staring the resurrected Jesus in the face? He said, my Lord and my God. You see, biblical faith isn't merely saying, that something is true, it isn't merely saying it could have happened. Biblical faith is a commitment to a person. When Thomas saw Jesus for himself, he knew that he was Lord and King. So whether or not you realized it before this morning, the most important question that you could ask today and every day is the one that I asked at the beginning of this sermon. Did it really happen? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because if he is, you must acknowledge him as your Lord and God. John 20, 24-31 gives us a reason to doubt. But it's a reason that crumbles in the face of a reason to believe. And it leaves us, every one of us, with a reason to to read. So what will you do with these three reasons? Every one of us is either believing or unbelieving in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of the beautiful things about this story is that it shows that real people, real people like Thomas, can actually go from unbelieving to believing. Our doubt, our skepticism, our hesitations, the fact that we just haven't thought about it that much, all of those things don't stop Jesus Christ from saving real people like you and me. And that's true for a simple reason. Jesus loves doubters. Jesus loves skeptics. 
Jesus loves those who are indifferent toward him. Jesus cares. Jesus had died for Thomas, and Thomas's doubt was not going to stand in the way of Jesus saving him. So I invite you, if you seek the risen and reigning Jesus Christ through prayer and through his word, he will reveal himself to you. This morning, every one of us has heard the words of the risen Christ to Thomas and to every one of us. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So what is your response to him? What is your confession? Is your confession the confession of Thomas? My Lord and my God. Father, I confess that your Son is Lord and God. And I thank you that you saved Thomas in spite of his doubts. And I ask that you will do the same for every one of us. I pray for the people in this room and ask that you will give us faith in the resurrection of your Son. I pray this in his name. Amen.